Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. of Hallmark cards bring you an unusual true story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. And here is our distinguished host, Mr. Lionel Barrymore. And welcome to the Hallmark Hall of Fame, where we offer you true stories about real people. Man observes the earth and the heavens and all they contain and asks, what are these things? What laws govern them? Occasionally, these questions are partially answered and we become that much more the masters of our environment. Now, one of those who added to that mastery was Benjamin Franklin. And tonight, we're going to tell you a delightful true story about Franklin when he was really the misunderstood man. Now, here is Frank Goss from the makers of Hallmark Cards. Have you ever wondered why it's so easy to find a Hallmark card that says what you want to say just the way you want to say it? Well, let me tell you the reason. The makers of Hallmark Cards are aware of the important part greeting cards play in your social life, of the links of friendship they represent. And so every Hallmark card is designed to meet specific standards of quality and good taste. Only the best will do for you to send to your friends. And because these standards have been maintained through the years, the Hallmark and crown on the back of each card you mail means you care enough to send the very best. Lionel Barrymore appears by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the Cole Porter musical Kiss Me Kate, starring Katherine Grayson, Howard Keel, and Ann Miller. And now, Mr. Barrymore brings you tonight's exciting story on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. In 1746, Ben Franklin was 40 years old. He was in business as a printer, he was also editing and publishing a weekly newspaper called the Saturday Evening Post and a yearly almanac, serving as secretary of the Pennsylvania Assembly and postmaster of Philadelphia, and directing that city's first firefighting body and first public library, both of which he had personally founded, studying Latin, French, Italian, Spanish, German, and Gaelic and perfecting his skill as a harpist, a cellist, violinist, and guitar player. And in his spare time <laughs> uh, that summer, he fastened upon a new interest, the, the consequences of which are soon forthcoming. For shame, Will, for shame. You march to your father's study at once and let him deal with you. I said I'm sorry, Mother. The son of Benjamin Franklin brawling in the street like a rowdy apprentice. I struck but one blow. That's hardly brawling, Mother. Go to your father, Will. Yes, Mother. Yes? Is that you, Debbie, dear? It's Will, Father. Yes, Will? Mother said you're to deal with me for having struck Tony Carter on the cheek with my fist. Oh? Well, come in, boy, come in. Now, how did it come about? I was provoked, sir. You know my convictions concerning violence. Yes, but Tony said his father and others hold you to be a witch and a wizard, so I puddled him. <laughs> Ridiculous. You should have laughed at him. Tony said his father told him you once calmed the waters of the West Pond simply by waving your cane over them. He said even though there was a breeze blowing, the waters became smooth at once. Did he? Yes, sir. And he said Burgess, the glass blower, was fashioning bottles for you. Bottles that bit people. <laughs> Go on. That's all there is. That's when I smashed him. 
Because I knew he was telling lies about you. Ah, but he wasn't. It's perfectly true. I once did calm the waters of West Pond, and my bottles do bite. Father! Let me teach you not to resort to violence in the future. But, Father! Don't look at me that way, my boy. I haven't sold my soul to the devil, if that's what you're thinking. You... you actually still the waters by waving a staff over them? Uh, yes, but I was not much older than you at the time. And far more delighted to hoax people than I am now. So I didn't let anyone see that my staff was hollow and filled with oil. I simply uncorked it and scattered the oil over the pot. Oh! Yeah, no. And, and the bottles that bite? Well, that is another matter. I don't suppose you ever heard of electricity? I thought not. Well, neither did I before I met a Dr. Spence in Boston. He knows as much about it as anyone in the world, which is very little indeed. However, you see this? You know what it is? Uh, a large lump of rosin? Well, almost. It's amber. Rosin is what I use on my bow before playing the fiddle. Now, I'm going to rub this amber with this old woolen stocking just as hard as I can. And while I do, you tear that piece of paper on my desk into little scraps, and I'll show you something that will astonish you. Yes, sir. Dr. Spence informed me that in the Greek tongue, amber is called electron. From this word was derived the term electricity I mentioned. Shall I do that for you, Father? No, thank you. No. Now, various objects, when briskly rubbed like this, acquire a mysterious force, invisible, untouchable, and till now, inexplicable. Ah, that should be enough. Now, watch closely. I now bring the amber slowly toward the scraps of paper, but before I reach them, there. The scraps leap from the desk to the amber. Most interesting, sir. Oh, you're not astonished. Well, I rather expected something more. Uh, well, then let's see what else it will do. Uh, extend your forefinger. Move it toward the amber. Closer. Still closer. Ow! <laughs> it bit me! Uh, now are you astonished? Yes, I see you are. It bit me! A spark of fire jumped out of it and burned my finger. What was it? Well, no one knows, but I'm told all bodies contain it. The rubbing seems to fill the amber to overflowing with this, this electric fluid. Some spilled onto your finger. E electric fluid? Yes, and like a fluid, it can be poured into a bottle and accumulated there, condensed as it were. A very specially prepared bottle, that is, like this one, which was invented in Leiden, Holland. Uh, I'm sorry I struck Tony, Father. I suppose people who tell the truth are often pummeled by those who know no better. <laughs> That's well observed, my boy. You shall have an extra sweet at dinner this evening. Now, as a wizard, I command you to vanish and leave me to my studies. <laughs> Several of Franklin's closest friends joined him in his experiments with this electric fluid and learned many of its properties. They discovered it would travel through water and through ice, that it could make loose threads writhe and curl like angry snakes, that a pointed body, such as a knife tip, more effectively attracts the electric fluid than a rounded body, such as the handle of that same knife. And in the spring of 1749... Uh, gentlemen, summer is at hand with its oppressive heat. I suggest we suspend our experiments until autumn. Yes, That's good idea. Right. Until autumn, then. Uh, it has been fascinating, but I'm chagrined that as yet we've been unable to produce anything useful to people. We could amuse them. Suppose we have a picnic, an electrical picnic. We'll invite our friends and show them how we can kill a turkey by electrical shock. And kindle the fire with a Leiden bottle and roast the bird with an electrical spit. Hey, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Uh, lend me a hand, will you, with the dismantling of this apparatus, and then we can do it. Good heavens, it was charged. Ben. Ben. Oh, 
frightened we were, Ben. We thought for a moment <laughs> that I died. <laughs> no, I'm not afraid of death. Even prepared for it, in fact. He's even written his epitaph, haven't you, Father? <laughs> you remember that, do you? Yes. The body of Benjamin Franklin, printer, like the cover of an old book, its contents torn out lies here. Yet the work itself shall not be lost for... for... For it will, as he believes, appear once more in a new and more beautiful edition, corrected and amended by the author. Now, help me up, will you? Yes. Oh, my dear. Here, what, ben. what did it feel like, Ben? Oh, Thomas, don't. <laughs> Let him alone. Always the scientist, eh, Thomas? Well, I've uh, a numbness in both arms and in the back of my neck. The hand that touched the chain feels like dead flesh. I felt a universal blow from head to foot as though I'd been struck by... by... Ah, yes. Struck by what? By lightning. Struck by lightning. Ben, please, tell me you'll have no more to do with this electric fluid. No more, Debbie, my love. I've barely begun. <laughs> Just coming over the city. Lightning has already hit something. See the smoke? Come down from there. The only safe place when there's lightning is on top of a chair with its legs in water. Ah, uh, we'll get on in a moment. Have some tea ready for us, there's a dear. That was close. You can even smell it, like rotten eggs. Uh, I can't help wondering if lightning and the electrical fluid are one and the same. They resemble each other in so many ways. Both give light of the same color. Both move crookedly like a tree branch, swiftly, and explode with a noise. If lightning were electrical fluid, I could tame it and render it harmless. Tame lightning, Father? Tame it? Ah, the electric fluid is attracted by pointed metal, like a knife. If the same is true of lightning, if the same is true of lightning, Father? Yes? A man who hopes to tame lightning should know enough to come out of the rain. Huh? It's begun to rain. Oh, oh yes. Yes, let's get below, Will, and to tea. <laughs> that summer was marked by many storms. Franklin watched the lightning crackle across the sky. One morning, the 6th of June, his son came to him in his study. Would you like to come swimming in the river with me? Ah, there's a storm brewing. I know, but it's so terribly warm. Even swimming seems like too much of an exertion. Mm hmm Once when I was your age, I swam down the river without exerting myself in the least. I lay on my back and let a kite act as a sail and pull me along. I'll never forget the look of a farmer's face when he saw me glide past, propelled by a sail higher than a steeple. He would... A kite. Of course, a kite. How could I have overlooked it? A kite, my boy, a kite! Just a moment, we return to the second act of the Hallmark Hall of Fame. The other day, my niece was in college, wrote a note to me which said, in essence, Uncle Frank, I've just discovered two new kinds of Hallmark Christmas cards, terrific cards that are really different. The Slim Jims and the High Cards. Why don't you talk about them one of these Sunday nights? Well, by this time, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with these bright new Christmas cards. The Hallmark Slim Jim cards are as distinctive as can be because each one is tall and narrow. A Slim Jim card is sure to stand out among all the other cards your friends receive. First, when it arrives in the mail, and then when it's placed on a mantle or a table. As for the Hallmark High cards, they're casual and gay, just as the name implies. Each High card is especially designed to say Merry Christmas in a warm, amusing way. 
you'll find both Slim Jims and High Cards among the many Hallmark Christmas cards you can select individually from the displays at fine stores. And you can count on it. The Hallmark and Crown on the back of each one will tell your friends you care enough to send the very best. And now Lionel Barrymore brings you the second act of our true story of Benjamin Franklin. Franklin flew the kite. He proved that lightning is electricity. The King of France sent him a letter of praise. The Royal Society of London sent him a gold medal. Harvard University gave him a degree, and, and so did Yale and William and Mary. Ben Franklin appreciated these honors, but as a practical man, he sought to make his discovery useful as well as illuminating. And that is where the trouble began. Just a moment, son. Just a moment. What's that? That, my boy, is a lightning rod. It looks like the water you put on top of the kite. And so it is. Just like it. Will it bite? <laughs> no, son. There's no electricity in the lightning rod. Then, then what are you going to do with it? Well, you remember when we flew the kite? How the wire drew the electrical fluid from the clouds? Well, that's what this lightning rod will do. If one were to... Put it atop a house, it would attract the lightning as our kite did and render it harmless. But, but that will burn the house down. That, my boy, is precisely what it will not do. Ah, I think if it will, with one of these rods atop a house or a barn, there'd be no fear of lightning. Think of the human lives we could save in addition to the thousands, even millions of dollars in property damage. <laughs> Might even put that fire department I found it out of business. And so the flying of the famous kite resulted in the invention of the lightning rod. But it was still unknown to Ben's neighbors. It was several nights later. Temple, Mrs. Franklin, I and the fire company tell Ben to come quickly and lend us a hand with the pump. Well, he's putting on his britches. He'll be down immediately. Where's the fire, Mr. Temple? Down the street, ma'am. You see the flames? It's the old Camwell place. Are we in danger? The whole city's in danger if it's allowed to spread. Good oh. evening, Adam. Good evening, oh, gentlemen. Uh, take your position, Ben, next to me. Fire company, again, John, quick time for March. How did it happen? Hit by lightning. Roof started the blaze at once. Keep step, gentlemen. Step right, step right, step right, step right. I could have prevented it, Adam. Prevented the fire? Yeah. I could have rendered the lightning harmless with my lightning rod. Lightning rod? A length of sharply pointed metal here and there on the roof would have deflected the lightning bolt. It would have attracted the lightning to itself, and then down harmless land. Fire fighting company! Oh! Ah! Hose men to your stations! Puffers to your stations! Stand back there, please, out of the way, please. Ready? Begin! Up! Down! Up! Down! Up! Down! And you, Ben, stand by with the axe, will you? Ah! Uh, what was that you said? Your lightning rod attracts the lightning? Uh, attracts? Yes, before it can strike, the metal attracts it. For me, it... no disrespect, Ben. It sounds mad. Yeah, yeah, it is mad. Attracting lightning bolts is the last thing they want to do. Preventing them now, that well, that's something else. A steady, boy, steady, steady, man. Up, down, up, down. It can't be prevented. It can only draw its teeth, so to speak, before it bites. Madam, I, I'd stake my reputation off. Will you back me up when I propose it? No, not I, Ben. No, I'm against it. It might send all of Philadelphia up in smoke. No. 
No, fly your kite, Ben. Let it go at that. That's a good fella. Now, 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 a bit faster, gentlemen. Uh, uh, down. Down. Ed must have been particularly trying to Ben Franklin to have his proposal rejected by the firefighting company he'd personally founded. Seeking support, he turned to the administrator of the public library he had himself started. My dear Ben, I want you to understand that I have given your request for support the most serious consideration. I, I'm sure you have, Lennox. In all of Philadelphia, there isn't a book concerned with lightning, not a pamphlet, not a tract, not a newspaper article, which I have not read, the better to understand your proposal. Well, I can assure you there's no danger. I can deflect the lightning. Yes, I'm certain you can. But what gives me pause is the question, should you? What, well, are you serious? Should I save life and property? I consider the attempt of man, mere man, to ward off lightning as immoral. I might even say blasphemous. It is not for us, but for a higher power to decide these matters. And in guiding me to the lightning rod, was there no higher power? My mind is made up. And so, despite the fact that he'd been honored by kings and wise men, Despite his reputation for sagacity and public service, Ben Franklin was summoned by the governor of the colony. Now then, Mr. Franklin, what have you to say? Sir, about I... these numerous complaints. Sir. Blanche will be against you, huh? Sir. And these accusations of mischief. Speak up, sir. The complaints and accusations are founded upon ignorance and fear. Ignorance? Who would know more about the harmfulness of lightning than that same company of volunteers which fights the fires it sets, or the learned men who, after study, advise me that to draw lightning down upon us is to invite disaster? Uh, no, I... no, Mr. Franklin, it won't do. Say no more. Under pain of my great displeasure, say not another word of your pointy metal shafts. Silence! <laughs> The authorities considered the matter settled once and for all. But Ben Franklin took another view of it. However, he didn't argue the point. He never indulged in needless controversy. Mr. Franklin, sir, I've done reading proof on this year's edition of the Almanac. There's no error, sir. Ah, good, good. We'll start printing poor Richard at once. Do you like this one? Oh, I think it's one of the best, sir. Poor Richard's sayings are especially sharp and to the point. Experience keeps a dear school, but fools will learn in no other. I like that, Mr. Franklin. Well, thank you. That's not at all bad, is it? Well, get to work, Jamie. Run off 10,000 copies. Well? Well, sir, there's, there's one thing that troubles me. You advise people right here on page 11 that they can prevent lightning from striking themselves and their property by putting up lightning rods. And then you tell them how to do it. Yes? But I thought the governor forbade you to say a word more about it. Uh, so he did. But he said nothing about my printing it. <laughs> As the saying goes, Jamie, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And the common people in their wisdom had faith in Ben Franklin. They raised a protective forest of lightning rods, tens of thousands of them, in almost no time. Many of those who did not suffered for it. For, as poor Richard says, If you will not hear reason, she'll surely wrap your knuckles. Benjamin Franklin's lightning rod still saving lives and property across America today. Just one of his many great contributions to the world in which we live. Now, next week, we're going to honor a great American of today, a daring airman who was the first man to travel faster than sound. 
His real life adventure makes one of the most thrilling stories I've ever heard. Well, more about Major Charles Yeager of the United States Air Force in just a moment. Frank Goss here has a few hints about how you can make your Christmas gifts doubly appreciated. You know, it's often the little extra acts of thoughtfulness we do at Christmas time that make it the wonderful season it is. The extra time we take to find just the right presents. The extra care we take in wrapping them so they'll delight the receiver from the moment they're given. Now, one of the easiest ways I know to give each of your gifts a special personal look is to select your gift wrap accessories at a store where Hallmark cards are sold. You'll find a sparkling collection to choose from, beautiful papers in eye-catching colors with tags and seals to match. Yes, and here's a suggestion from the Hallmark gift wrapping artist. Keep the size of your boxes in mind when you shop. Choose tiny prints for tiny boxes and big bold prints for the largest gifts of all. And for variety, try using Hallmark gift trims on some of your gifts. They're the three-dimensional trims you can attach to the tops or sides of boxes in a jiffy for an extra touch of glamour. You'll know Hallmark gift wraps and trims instantly by the Hallmark and crown on the package. It's the familiar symbol you look for on your greeting cards when you care enough to send the very best. And now here again is Lionel Barrymore. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Frank. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, I want to ask all of you if you've seen the, the two-page ad for Hallmark Cords in this week's issue of Life magazine. Well, if you haven't, I hope you'll, you'll look for it because I think you'll find it has some very interesting facts and stories about the lives of some of our world-famous artists, like Grandma Moses, and Saul Steinberg, and Norman Rockwell, and writers, too, like Dr. Norman Vincent Peale. Yes, there's a little story about the famous people who designed or wrote for the new Hallmark Hall of Fame collection of Christmas cards. So do read about them in this week's issue of Life magazine. Frank, uh, now tell us a little about our very special event on next week's Hallmark Hall of Fame when we'll honor Major Charles Yeager, the first man to travel faster than sound. Next week, we present on the Hallmark Hall of Fame one of the most exciting true stories of our time. The thrilling story of man flying faster than sound is unparalleled in real life or in fiction. The suspenseful drama of man's courage and daring in the face of the unknown is best described by quoting the words of Major Yeager himself. Any man who's ever been engaged in experimental flying knows what it is to be scared. He hopes everything will go just the way it's supposed to, but he doesn't know for sure until he climbs in his ship and tries it. <laughs> so be sure to be with us next week when Major Yeager will be here to actually tell you this exciting and gripping true story. Remember, you're also invited to the Hallmark Hall of Fame on television every Sunday, starring Miss Sarah Churchill. Until next week, then, this is Lionel Barrymore saying good night. Look for Hallmark cards that are sold only in stores that have been carefully selected to give you expert and friendly service. Remember, a Hallmark card when you care enough to send the very best. Our producer-director is William Gay. Our script tonight by Walter Brown Newman. Benjamin Franklin was played by John McIntyre. Featured in our cast, Jeanette Nolan, Suffy Singer, Polly Bear, Herb Butterfield, Howard McNear, and Johnny McGovern. This is Frank Goss saying goodnight to you until next week at the same time, when we'll tell you the actual story of Major Charles Yeager and his flight through the sound barrier. The week after that, we'll tell you about the founder of the famous Peace Awards, Alfred Nobel. And on December 20th, we'll again present Mr. Lionel Barrymore's traditional appearance as Scrooge in Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol on the Hallmark Hall of Fame. This is KMBC, Kansas City, Missouri.